Hey, friends, it's the Drive to School podcast. I'm Pastor Goodman, and Pastor Brademeyer is back. Pastor Brademeyer and I talk philosophy and all sorts of fun stuff. How are you doing, my friend? I'm doing pretty good. Getting everything ready for fall up here. The garden's cleaned up. The chickens are in the freezer. So I guess we're ready for snow, but I hope it takes a while. I'm, I'm ready for it. Uh, I, I, I just, I, I was down in Texas for a few years. I missed it. We got like one big blizzard in Texas and San Antonio where it shut down the whole city for about a week. Um, and I'm ready for something like that. Again, it slows us down. It sort of makes me remember, you know, I don't actually have to be all the places I think that I do. It's, I, I, I like that. Um, but I, I'm, I'm weird, I guess. Um, you know, I like winter. I just don't like six months of winter. This is the problem with living in North Dakota, right? It's right. nice when you get a nice you know, foot of snow that's nice and fluffy for Christmas. And and then it can just go away after that. That's right. Fun. That's fair. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll join you in complaining about it as soon as Christmas is done. Um, but but uh, until then, uh, we also have philosophy. So um, we have been sort of making our way through sort of the, do we call them the modes of philosophy? The, the schools of philosophy? I would just kind of call them sub Okay. That would probably be the best way to think. All right. So we are on, uh, you told me before we were started recording Logic today, um, which has been the one I've been trying to jump to every single time we sat down. So I'm very excited for it. Well, I, I hope I don't disappoint. Yeah. So we're, you know, we've talked about, uh, we talked about metaphysics, you know, the mm -hmm. foundational principles of reality and how we look at them. We've talked about um, epistemology, how we can know things. Uh, we talked about ethics, you know, how do we know and relate to the good. And so today we're talking about logic because the problem is, of course, Philosophers like to distinguish, and the problem with the real world is while we can distinguish things, they aren't separable. You know, they do relate to each other. You know, like in church, we have the law and the gospel, and they are distinct, right? But at the same time, there's a logic that connects the two, and they do are both the word of God, and we have to talk about both. It's just a matter of keeping it right in your head and right in your creature and teaching. Well, the same right. thing kind of holds for philosophy, and that's why you kept jumping to logic, because as you're talking about this stuff, you're trying to use reason, and logic is really the study of argument and correct reason. And so that's why you keep jumping to it, because, you know, we need to think, and we need to think clearly. And uh, if we're not thinking clearly and we're not you know, able to communicate that effectively, then we have a problem because what we're talking about then very quickly just becomes probably guilty. Right. So you're kind of laying this out. Um, but so what is the purpose of logic? So um, logic's purpose is to study arguments themselves. Right. So epistemology focuses on us and how we can know and what we can know. Logic actually looks at the material that we're knowing and tries to make sure that it's internally coherent, that it actually corresponds to reality, and that it's correctly placed together so that things necessarily follow from each other. Right. So, the, so it's not even just what is it, but why does it matter? Well, it's a, you know, there's a little bit of that, too. But I guess it's more just making sure that the things we talk about are internally consistent and also consistent with the world. So epistemology is focusing on me perceiving the world and adequately relating to it and being able to understand and know it. Logic's more looking at the objects of our knowledge and making sure that they're knowable, understandable, that they're coherent to themselves, and that we can talk about them in useful ways, right? So, you know, examples of this would be reason, right? Just making sense when you talk. Critical thinking, that's a, a big phrase everyone likes to throw around these days, making sure that when we think, our thoughts aren't just crazy nonsense that pops out of nowhere. Inductive reasoning, like we have in science, deductive reasoning, like we see in mathematics or in formal logic. You know, all these ways of thinking and presenting information to ourselves and to others, this is kind of the purview of logic. Great. So um, it almost, I, I got to like ask the obvious trolling question of um, how, how are you a pastor then and, and want to talk about something being internally and externally consistent when we have a guy who stopped being dead? Um, that, that doesn't make sense. So this is a, a really great place for us, uh, I think, as, as pastors to, to be able to embrace logic and start to say, you know, this is something that, that isn't just sort of a, a, a wing and a prayer, um, but, but rather we're, we're holding on to something that, that is, is consistent. So start to apply, I guess, then in practice, logic to the scriptures and that which they confess. Well, you know, here's the thing about logic. There's different ways to employ logic. There's logic in its purest sense, right? Where we just start with nothing and we look at the world and we start with the axioms. These are the basic self-evident things of the universe and building on them in consistent ways to something more complex, right? But there's also kind of logic that, you know, follows certain events in history. And so, okay, why are we Christians? You know, it's not just because, I mean, I shouldn't say just because this sounds terrible because it sounds like I'm disagreeing with the catechism. I'm really not. But the reason we have faith, of course, theologically speaking, is because the Holy Spirit has given us the gift of faith as response to the word of God being preached to us. The gospel has been conferred on us. The word and sacrament, the Holy Spirit has worked that into faith in our minds and in our hearts and in our very being. Okay, that's true. 
But at the same time, our brains and our minds are not divorced from that. It goes, you know, we're a whole person. We can't not, you know, we can't not think about stuff because God made us, and among other things, be thinking beings. And so when we get to the Christian religion, it has truth claims, right? And these truth claims are, you know, debatable as truth claims. Right. And so it's one of the things that drives me crazy because I hear this even from Christians. Well, you just have to take that on faith. Now, there are some things that that's true, but faith is not this thing that's divorced from reality or intellect or reason. It's not this separate category that's wholly other. That's not the way that Christians talk about faith. And so what I'm trying to get at is that the reason that we can have a reason to believe in Jesus is because of the resurrection. That validates him as God because he wasn't held by death. And we can look at the historical arguments for that. We have all these different authors in the New Testament that claim to be independent people who have seen him or who have interviewed people who have seen him in his resurrected state. Um, we have enemies of the gospel, right? Roman and, and Jewish historians who are not uh, convinced of the gospel who testify to the empty tomb. They have different theories about it, but they agree that there's these guys running around saying this has happened and they're like dying for it and stuff. And that's kind of weird, but you know, and then you also can look at the people who are closest to Jesus and how they live their lives, that they were willing to die. Ten of the twelve apostles were martyred according to church legend and church history. The only two that weren't were Judas because he killed himself, and John, who died, was the only one to die of natural causes as an elderly man. And so you put all that together, and you go, okay, well, this seems to be a reasonable thing to believe based on all this historical attestation, right? So that makes my intellect happy. Even though I have faith, now I have a reason for my faith, right? Faith seeks understanding, right? Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Isn't that a prayer that we ought to pray? And part of the ways that we help our unbelief is by, you know, understanding. And so you start with that premise that Jesus is who he says he is, and he's testified to that by his life and his resurrection. Then you have to go back and look at what he says, right, and what he does. So you look at the cross and you go, oh, hey, when he died there, that, that seems pretty important. And then you look at what he says about that and how that pays for our sins. And you look at what he says about things like Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And if this guy is God and he's going to roll back death, I probably should take him seriously when he speaks about stuff. Right. And right. so it all kind of hinges off of that. And it's a logical progression. Right. right? So it's reason. Uh, our faith isn't rooted in reason, but our faith is reasonable. Um, like it, it's right. actually, you think about it. And so when we as Lutherans talk about this, we talk about where to sort of put scripture. So scripture exists above our reason. So our reason doesn't trump scripture, but scripture trumps our reason because, well, God is smarter than us. Uh, he knows things we don't know. But at the same time, if there is such a thing as a God, and we believe that there is, well, he's reasonable. You, you can actually find this to be consistent, not only with itself, but also with the world at, at large. And this is, I think, now where we have to put up the limits of reason, right? So there have been attempts in Christian history, like, you know, the excesses of medieval scholasticism or certain segments of Reformed theology, where reason becomes magisterial, becomes over the scriptures and over other things of faith, and it tries to explain everything. And you come to some very strange positions about who God is. And, um, you know, like, like our, um, our, our reading last week um, in the one-year lectionary was Jesus, uh, Matthew chapter 9, Jesus was accused of blasphemy, right? And, and we had, uh, in my sermon, I spent some time talking about what blasphemy is. And one of the things that blasphemy is when we mislead people about who God is. Mm -hmm. right? And so, you know, if we try to put our reason above what God says, then we come to some weird conclusions that mislead people about God. Um, and, and this is a problem for us because God is who he is. And so, you know, he, he's above all merciful, right? But what, are, what is my reason giving? So let's just put ourselves out in nature. We have nothing except our minds and, and the world around us. And we look at the world and we go, wow, this world is beautiful. Right? And, and this gets into aesthetics about how there's an objective beauty to things. It's why God's designed this way. But we look at the world and we see that it's beautiful and that things are predictable and it makes sense. I mean, yeah, there's some weird parts, but on the whole, it's a good thing. And it's you know reproducible. It's, it makes sense that I'm provided for. And you go, wow, okay. And it seems like this has to exist for a reason. And the closer I look at nature, the more intricate it is and the smaller and smaller of a chance there is this could just happen you know, arbitrarily. And so then I come up with the idea there must be some creator out there. We'll call that creator God. Um, because, you know, as we talked about before with, like, contingency of being and stuff, there has to be something very different than us. So we come up with the idea of God the creator. I can't get much further than that with my reason. Right? right. And that's, that's about as far as I can go. I can't come up with a savior or a redeemer. I can't see God as merciful. I mean, you look at the world and you see hornets that lay their eggs and heads of ants and horrific stuff like that. You know, the creator seems to got a twisted streak, maybe. I mean, there is cancer after all, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I can find the law inside of creation. Um, I just can't find the gospel. That actually has to be preached to us. The, the order, and that's a good thing. It doesn't mean that there is sort of a bad part of God there. I'm really, really glad that uh, we managed to make it around the sun. Um, I, I'm really, really glad that, that everything is set up in such an order so that life can exist. The law is good, but the law is not going to save me. It's, it's just like nature where the bear is going to kill me, even if he's majestic while he does it. Right. Yeah, it'll be a very good looking death for everyone that's not you. Everyone that's not me. So um, here then, uh, like you said, it, it's, logic is a good it, a good thing. God gave you this mind. And yes, it's been, uh, it is fallen. It's been corrupted by sin. It's not always going to work perfectly. And also just, you're not God. But at the same time, um, it, it's a good thing to, to think. So we, we can apply logic to the scriptures as long as we, we sort of hold the scriptures uh, to be superior. We can also apply logic to the rest of the world too, right? Right. And, and so like when it comes to the scriptures, you know, this is what, uh, if you've ever heard your pastor talk about hermeneutics, which is a $10 phrase and you go to school for a long time to learn it to sound smart. But um, it's the art of reading the scriptures really is what it is, right? It's learning how to read the Bible appropriately. And there's a logic. So like one of our scriptural interpreting principles is scripture is interprets itself. Scripture interprets scripture, right? We take clear passages to enlighten unclear passages. Why do we do that? Because there's a reasonableness to doing it that way. Imagine trying to do it the other way around. Well, that would be really confusing. You know? um, right. and it's, it's true also that we can look at the world, but I think you hit on something that's absolutely essential in this. When we're talking about logic and reason, we're really dealing with matters of the law. And while we can maybe use it to explicate or understand things of the gospel a little bit, at the end of the day, it does play by the law. Right? It's by the structures that God put into the world. And so it can only go so far. Because the gospel is something other than the law, right? It is not something that comes about as a logical necessity. It's a free act of grace out of the love of God. And so that's the thing we have to remember. And that's why it's always dangerous for us to take and put reason above scripture because we lose the gospel. I never thought about it that way, but that's 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 brilliant. Um, and, and I mean, if you consider it, the gospel tends to defy logic. It, it's it's not a reasonable thing, it, but it, it's it's a good thing that is confessed to us. And that's that's why we we need to hear it. It sort of lets us hold that tension that faith does come by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ, that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to him, but the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel. But it also lets us then consider the gifts of the scripture logically. Right. And so it's it's a tool, like all the other tools God's given us. You know, it's a tool for us to use for for his purposes. You know, we, we are called to steward everything that God has blessed us. And we often talk about stewardship just being maybe your talents or you know, uh, your time or your, your money, right? Your time, talents, and treasures usually talk about. But we forget that our imaginations, our memories, our minds, our reason, all the faculties of our mental selves are gifts too. And we should use them for things that God would have us use for. So we can use our reason to, def you know, have a clear defense of the Christian faith like we're called to do in Scripture. Or we can use it to belittle and attack the Christian faith, right? I mean, we or anything in between. We can just choose not to think and be like that one slave who buried his talent in the ground did nothing with it, which didn't work out very good, right? Or we can actually form and strengthen our minds with clear thinking exercises, just like we strengthen our muscles, um, so that we can use it for the things that God would have us do, right? I mean, we are fallen, we are broken, none of us thinks perfectly, but we can get better at it by actually practicing good thinking, reading people who think clearly, and, you know, engaging with good ideas. One of the reasons why I'm a big fan of classic literature, you know, stuff that stands the test of time stands the test of time for a reason. You know, I mean, sometimes no, but usually. <laughs> so um, no, that's, there's a lot to kind of chew on here. Is there anything else we should kind of hold on to with logic? Well, um, you know, I wanted to talk about kind of like the big one everyone likes is, you know, fallacies. Those are okay. all go through errors of thinking, but I think we're probably nearly out of time, aren't we? Yeah, um, and honestly, uh, one of the things I would recommend is uh, I actually got to sit down with Erica Jacoby, the executive director of Higher Things, and we did nothing but logical fallacies for um, a about a month. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of really cool episodes there that I would encourage you guys to check out. Um, now that you kind of have a foundation here, you can kind of go and watch it be misused by Erica. Um, and well, honestly, she points out when I misuse it, but it, it's it's more fun for everybody that way. <laughs> and, you know, and I think the last thing is, is that there's a few terms I think are helpful. Um, in, in this. The first thing is, is that when we talk about an argument, which is not a me yelling at you kind of thing, it's just a statement I'm asserting and trying to prove it's true. That's, that's what an argument means philosophically. And so there's two things. There's premises, which are statements that build to a conclusion, which either follows or doesn't follow. And when we talk about this, there's two ways to analyze these sets of statements together. They can be valid, which means that the internal logic is good, that A plus B equals C, right? 
Um, or it can be invalid where a plus b doesn't equal c, but I claim that it does. And so there's a problem with my thinking. And then there's also soundness. Because you can have an argument that's internally consistent, but doesn't actually conform to reality. So in order for an argument to be really logical, it needs to be both valid, that is internally consistent, and sound. It actually has to you know, fit with reality. And then the other thing, too, is logic is just something we do when we're nerds who study philosophy or maybe, you know, theologians who want to get back to the old school medieval scholastic way of doing things. Um, we also use it in mathematics, computer science, um, study of language. I mean, it shows up in a lot of different fields that we take for granted. In these That's so fantastic. I, so I was just going to say I would commend people that are interested in science and those kinds of things. Study logic is really helpful when you engage with, you know, learning and research. Absolutely. And it will, in fact, in a lot of ways to help you start to fall away from uh, dangerous religion. Um, so if I told you, for example, um, that I found, I don't know, hypothetical golden plates buried in a field somewhere and only I could tell you what they said. Um, but it totally makes sense as long as you don't actually look at reality. Um, if you thought about that for a little bit, maybe you could dodge a bullet. Um, just putting that out there. Um, so Logic, big fan. Um, Pastor Bradamire, also a big fan. Thanks so much for joining the Drive School today. Oh, thanks. Thanks for having me. Hey, have a good one. Yep, you too.